Today's episode of Scrolling to Death is sponsored by Bark Technologies. I am so grateful that these days parents have a safer device option for our kids. The Bark phone was built for families who are looking to ramp up their child's online safety. It has parental controls built in and allows us to manage screen time and their entire digital experience super easily. Now let's jump into my conversation with Andrea Brambila about screen time. Welcome to Scrolling to Death. Today I'm excited to be joined by therapist and fellow mom, Andrea Brambila. Hey, Andrea. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Yay. Okay. So yeah, I'm so excited to talk about all kinds of things. And, um, but first as a therapist, you specialize in perinatal mental health and developmental psychology. Can you tell me what that means? (laughs) Yeah. So perinatal (laughs) mental health is basically like the mental health surrounding pregnancy. So pre, prepartum, uh, pregnant and then postpartum. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a lot going into that in terms of like, I specialized in women that were having fertility issues for a long time. Okay. Um, yep. And then working through the pregnancy and then all of the fun postpartum stuff afterwards. Um, and I've always had a really strong interest in developmental psychology, which is essentially like how do how does your brain develop throughout your entire life cycle, but mostly mm-hmm. looking at like birth to about age 25 um, in terms of development. Amazing. Okay. That mental health conversation around pregnancy and after birth is something I didn't really think about much. Like, I I don't know when you have kids in your late twenties, maybe I was just too young to like really think about it, but I have friends having babies now and they're like really cued in to how they're feeling and asking for help. And I'm like, man, I wish I was, I was at that phase. That's so great. I was, so when I had my son, I was 24 Mm -hmm. um, and I was newer into the therapy world. And 10 years ago, everything was just postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did not have that. I had postpartum anxiety and it took Mm -hmm. me a very long time to even realize that I had postpartum anxiety as a therapist. Yeah. Is is there a postpartum OCD as well? Is that something I've heard? Um, Yes. I I mean, I think that really like any of the mental health disorders can be triggered by the hormone fluctuations around postpartum. Uh, So, yeah. Okay. So today we're going to focus on uh, the importance of independent play, some tips for limiting screens. Um, I also just want to lament together about raising kids during COVID and what we learned um, Mm -hmm. during that time. Um, But let's touch on, you have a large community on Instagram. Your handle is Brambila underscore bits. And I wonder like, what is that journey? What inspired you to start reaching parents on Instagram? Yeah, so um, I had a really challenging introduction to parenthood. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband and I had a couple of pregnancy losses before we got pregnant with our son. Mm -hmm. And then I had my son um, and I struggled significantly with postpartum anxiety, not depression, but just like very nervous, anxious all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really felt that way for about four years, even doing like therapy and very traditional treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it took me a really long time to get brave enough to have our second child. Mm -hmm. And when we did, I really decided at that point, like, I cannot, I cannot repeat this. Like it, it was manageable, but it was just so close to being unmanageable. And it was just so exhausting. Yeah. And so coming through it on the other, like when you're in it, sometimes Mm -hmm. you don't realize like how draining it is. And then you Mm -hmm. get to the other side and you're like, Wow, that was really rough. Yeah. Um, so when I got pregnant with my daughter, I decided to really research some like actionable things outside of the therapeutic world that I could do that would help support me and my therapy um, and manage my postpartum anxiety a little bit better. Yeah. And there were a number of things that I found um, that were very contradictory to the way that parenting is, I feel like displayed or shown these days, especially with social media. Okay. Um, Like, Mm -hmm. you know, you see all of these like lovely invitations to play where like parents are like setting up like really pretty activities that take a long (laughs) time and require a lot of prep work, but that's just, it's a lot to maintain and keep up with and do on a day-to-day basis. And so a lot of what I was coming across when I was researching was that some of these things are really like, they're just making it more challenging than it needs to be in Mm -hmm. terms of parenting. Um, And so I really took a step back and started to work to apply a lot of what I had 
read just sort of as an experiment. Um, and I was really amazed at how different my second postpartum experience was, mm -hmm. even though I was working more, I had less support, um, in terms of like family. Yeah. Um, and, but my postpartum experience was just so much different and I felt so much better. I wasn't overstimulated all the time. I didn't feel overwhelmed all the time. And a lot of it was because we transitioned our family into a much more like low screen lifestyle as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and we learned how to really support independent play so that like my daughter can do things. Uh, she can play while I am doing things. And then when she rests or when she goes to bed at night, like I can actually relax instead of feeling like I need to speed clean my entire house or like try and run all of my errands while she is napping at yeah. home with dad and like just so much pressure was taken off of me. And so at that point, um, I started wanting to kind of share this stuff from like a mental health perspective mm -hmm. um, and things kind of transitioned. And I was, as I was doing more of these things and really continuing to do all of the research, you know, I mm -hmm. have an older son who's almost 11 yeah. and it was very interesting because there was more emerging research on things like um, social media and cell phone use and mm -hmm. YouTube and how all of these things are impacting some of these older kids. Um, and I had seen that in my own private practice working with teenagers. Um, and so that's kind of, that's really what I share is like, how do we approach technology as like a holistic family unit in a way that um, supports like my mental health, supports my husband's mental health, allows us to get things done mm -hmm. and also protects both of our kids from these things that I think we are seeing becoming more and more concerning. So that was a very long no. answer. No, that was so interesting. And there's so many things there. I, I think it's so fascinating how just limiting of the screen time and ramping up of independent play and experiences can positive, positively affect, you know, an, an almost three-year-old, an 11-year-old, a grown woman and a grown man, you know, across yeah. the board, the benefits are, are pretty impressive. And you touched for, quickly or briefly on that you were seeing on, I'm assuming Instagram or whatever social media platform, like these perfectly put together activities that parents are setting up for their kids. And that was something that I noticed a lot through COVID specifically was mm -hmm. everyone's home. And how are these moms like thriving and putting together these amazing activities for their kids and making the most of their time. And I'm sitting here trying to work and just crying and struggling and all this stuff. But first of all, the reminder that like, that perfect looking activity is not perfect. Like the picture is perfect, but yeah. what's really happening in real life is and not. <laughs> the reality that a kid is probably playing with it for like four minutes mm -hmm. and it took 35 minutes to set up. Yeah. And is it more for the picture and the portrayal of the social media yeah. you know, perfection rather than for the child's experience? Like you have yeah. to, you have to ask. Uh, Jumping in here to tell you guys a little bit more about the best phone for kids, and that is the Bark phone. If you don't want your kids signing up for social media, an iPhone is not going to do it. The Bark phone starter plan comes with talk and text only. If and when you're ready to start integrating some social media access or more screen time, there are advanced plans available that offer social media, but not without your approval. Plus, it has advanced content monitoring and will send you alerts of potential dangers. So when it comes to a basic phone that won't addict your child and distract them from school or healthy activities, the Bark phone is where it's at. If your child already has an iPhone or an Android and you don't want to switch it up, please layer on the Bark parental controls as a baseline. You can set rules around screen time, block certain websites and apps. You still get alerts and tons more helpful options for parents. Back to my chat with Andrea about screen time. So what is your family's approach, if you could summarize it, to screen time specifically now? Yeah, so we, like I said, we're pretty low screen. So I definitely don't feel like you know, there are some people that will say like screens are not ever acceptable or appropriate. And mm -hmm. I, I don't agree mm -hmm. because I think that we live in a reality where like, that's just not realistic. Yeah. I do think that it's really important for us to be mindful about how, so I feel like there's two ends of the spectrum. So I get mm -hmm. parents that will say like, this is too extreme. You know, we're in a world where screens are around, like we need to teach our kids to be around screens. And then I get mm -hmm. other parents who are like, screens are the worst thing in the world. Like, keep them away from your kids at all costs, like yeah. live in a commune. <laughs> right. 
off grid and that's just not realistic for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so our approach, I feel like is much more in the middle where, you know, like we allow our kids to watch TV. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very mindful about what sort of shows my daughter watches specifically because she's a, she's a lot younger and mm -hmm. she's a lot more easily overstimulated and she's a lot spicier than my yeah. son. So when she yeah. gets overstimulated, she, mm -hmm. she's a harder <laughs> pill to yeah. swallow. I like the term spicier. Um, yeah. <laughs> But so we're, we're very mindful about the shows that she watches. She gets a lot less screen time again, because she gets overstimulated a lot more. So she watches TV, maybe like 20 to 40 minutes a day, about mm -hmm. three to five times a week. Um, yep. And then my son who is almost 11, he probably gets about an hour of screen time a day. Mm -hmm. um, and his kind of varies between like watching TV or playing um, video games. Like he likes Minecraft. Um, he likes mm -hmm. some of the like, he likes Mario Kart, like some of the racing games. Yeah. Um, but we do try to be really mindful about setting boundaries that we can maintain um, yeah. and that yeah. don't feel like burdensome to us, but are also still protecting our kids. Um, so like one area that was a big struggle for us for a long time was YouTube for my older son mm -hmm. um, because he was, he was, I think he was five when COVID happened. Mm -hmm. um, and so he got a lot more screen time during those years and he would watch shows on, on YouTube. And back then it really didn't feel like a concern for us. He wasn't coming across things that were inappropriate, mm -hmm. um, but he was like watching shows where adults were acting like idiots mm -hmm. and he was reenacting that. And it was like just mm -hmm. obnoxious almost behavior. Yeah, um, yeah. And so we tried to set limits around it. We, we battled with it for, for months where we would be like, you can only watch these channels. You can only watch this amount. And mm -hmm. it felt like we were constantly policing him. Um, yeah. And yeah. he was getting into trouble with it. Yeah. And we ultimately just like, we eliminated it because he, at, at some point I realized like, you, like, I'm a therapist. I understand child development. Like I can't expect, it's not developmentally appropriate for me to expect him to be mm -hmm. able to manage himself with this type of app that is like yeah, more addictive. and more designed yeah, yeah, to like keep people glued to it. And you know, again, five years ago, we didn't have things like shorts. Like there wasn't an algorithm that was like well-informed. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just a different experience for him. And over the years, it became more and more problematic. And as it became more and more problematic, yeah. it just got to a point where we we eliminated it and it was mm -hmm. we had to be really clear about like this isn't a punishment it's just not working for us as a family <laughs> mm -hmm. and we're arguing about an app yeah um, yeah so we we don't allow youtube he doesn't have a cell phone he doesn't have a personal device mm -hmm. um he has like a very old school ipod touch that he will use at home to like facetime his friends okay um, yeah and that's pretty much hit like he gets about, like I said, about an hour a day on average. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned like some parents will say, well, they they need to learn how to use it, um, mm -hmm. you know, at some age. And I've talked to experts that are like, listen, they make these iPads to be able so to be easy. used by babies. So there's no like learning curve here. And by the time that they're adults, so some people will say, well, they need to learn how to use it for adulthood, for jobs, things are going to change so much in four or five, 10 years mm -hmm. that whatever's available then is going to look so much different. So your kid doesn't need to learn how to use an iPad as a child. Like it's just yeah, not when, a necessity. When I look back at like my experience growing up, so I'm 30, I, I just turned 37. Mm -hmm. um, like my high school had a computer lab and we had right. like a family computer at home and mm -hmm. that was it. And now I work, I work online. I'm fully remote. I work for a large corporate company. I'm like very, mm -hmm. very normal remote working situation. I work in Excel and PowerPoint all day, every day. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't need to learn that until my twenties. Right. And you and pick it up. At that point, like it's fine. Yeah. 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 So there's that point, which is interesting. And I appreciate the like, personal device stance. I think that delaying kids use of personal devices, especially ones that are connected to the internet and can download yeah. whatever app they want. It's really important to delay that. Do you allow any 
personal device time for your almost three-year-old? No. Mm -mm. Right. Okay. That's very intentional. Um, yeah. Because again, like as a therapist, as I've come across more and more emerging research, all of this is so new. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, even when like we had our son, like the, he, you know, the iPad was very new, um, mm -hmm. but there wasn't any data around like, is this appropriate for a two-year-old? Um, but <laughs> now we have got mm -hmm. some new emerging data that's really showing like there's a difference in the way that kids receive and interact with like a TV that's on and like mm -hmm. a smaller screen that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot yeah. of it could be proximity, but like even when you watch like a small child, like watching TV, like if I watch my toddler, like she'll move around and she'll like mm -hmm. kind of play sometimes if the TV's on, she's yeah, not like you. locked in unless she's just really tired, mm -hmm. but it's very different. Like when you see a kid like on an iPad or on a cell phone, like it's just mm -hmm. because it's like right there, yeah. it's just a different experience for them. Yeah. And I wonder what your thoughts are. So every day when I, every time I go to the grocery store, you see moms or dads with the little baby or the toddler, like just staring at the device, um, in the cart. What do you, what do you feel about that specifically? Is it okay? Should parents try not to be handing their kids devices at the grocery store or at the restaurant, for example? Yeah. I think that that's a really hard subject specifically because of the way that our culture looks <clears throat> yeah, at childhood. Yeah. Yes. Um, so like, I don't know when, but at some point we have expected for children to act like small adults. Mm -hmm. And if they make any sort of noise or like <laughs> they're disruptive or heaven forbid that they like move faster than like a walk, like it's just not appropriate. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of pressure for parents to contain their children in these mm -hmm. public spaces. And mm -hmm. when you look at other countries, there isn't necessarily that same pressure and you don't see the same use of technology in cultures where it is more acceptable for kids to, to be kids and to be kids in public. Mm -hmm. um, I personally am very much an advocate for one of the best things that we can do for our kids is to allow them to experience the world as it is without mm -hmm. distractions. Yeah. Um, and I think that one of the best things that we can do is like take them to go run errands and to slow down enough to like allow them to have some sort of engagement. Um, so for example, like I can take my daughter to like when we have Amazon returns, mm -hmm. we do it at Kohl's and like right, I will too. let her like actually walk through the store and like hold on to the package and like mm -hmm. she'll put it on the thing and like I'll do the app and then as we're walking out like she'll she'll sometimes like climb on some of the furniture that's out on display mm -hmm. or she'll like touch some of the clothes and I'm not like dragging her out of the store or like sticking her in the cart which there's nothing wrong with like putting a child in the cart we put her in the cart when mm -hmm. take her to the grocery store all the time yeah um, but I think if we can slow down and allow them to engage with the world. Mm -hmm. You know, she's still going to have tantrums. She just had a tantrum mm -hmm. <laughs> at, at a clothing store recently. Um, but I see it so much less frequently with her. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is because like, she's not being overstimulated and she's not, mm -hmm. she's all being allowed to like engage with the world in a way that kids like their brains just crave, like they're trying to understand, they're trying to figure the world out. Yeah. And I think that we've started kind of depriving them of that experience. So yeah, my thought yeah. is like, I don't recommend it. Um, mm -hmm. Now I mm -hmm. get that like a lot of parents feel a lot of pressure to like, I got to get the grocery shopping done and I don't want my kid throwing a fit because everyone's going to stare at me. So I, yeah. I genuinely like empathize with it, but I think that we are definitely doing our kids a massive disservice by not mm -hmm. allowing for them to experience the world as it is. Yeah. And I think that's the main issue with handing the device. It's not even that them staring at the device. I mean, it's not good for them to do that. They're not actually, especially under two, like absorbing anything educational from it. But what you're doing is blocking the interaction with the world around them and with yeah. you. Like they learn their language skills, their um, emotional skills, their socialization from engaging with you as the parent and you're just like blocking that with the screen. And so I would just, I would love to see more parents just getting a little more uncomfortable in those situations, you know, um, and challenging their child a little bit more to 
to delay giving them the screen as long as possible. I think we'd be surprised at what our kids can pull off if we're engaging. Yeah. Them, right. And they're totally capable. I mean, when yeah. we think about like these types of screens are very new, like within the mm -hmm. last 15, 20 years. Yeah. Like, what did parents do before that? When we had yeah. to go grocery shopping, like put yeah. your kid in a grocery cart and like you, yeah. you got through it. Yeah, I, I do the same things at restaurants that my dad used to do and my mom. So we play I Spy, we play 20 Questions, and we also take the like little sugar packets and you can like build little houses mm -hmm. and things with them, like double decker houses. And so we, I just do what my parents taught me to do in a restaurant and that, that is engage them. Like I don't always love playing 20 Questions with a six-year-old, but you know, I just yeah. like, that's the time to engage with them. Otherwise I don't need to take, if, if I don't have the energy for it, like I'm not going to take them to the restaurant. Home. Right. Yeah. Right. But I know a lot of parents, especially at restaurants. So they'll hand their kids the device because they want to break and they want to be able to talk to each other and have, have quiet time. So what do you advise to parents like who say, well, if I don't give them screen time, like how do I get a break? What do you kind of say to that? So I definitely, again, um, I don't feel like I am super like anti screens. Yeah. Um, I definitely think that my recommendation is that like, especially the early years are very short. Mm -hmm. And I think espe even, especially for me, when I was struggling with postpartum anxiety and we were just like getting through every day, it felt like for the rest of our lives, we were going yeah. to be getting through every day. <laughs> And yeah. then suddenly I woke up and like my son was five and like mm -hmm. sitting through a meal at dinner was like no big deal. It was mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Um, and so my, my thought behind that is like, you know, it, the years, it feels hard, but if you can mm -hmm. delay the personal devices until mm -hmm. after I say generally like between sometime between four and seven, mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of benefit to it. Mm -hmm. And I think, and this is just anecdotal experience, but I think that you will have a child that is easier to take out and do things with um, if they have gotten acclimated and used to like going out and not having the screens mm -hmm. there. And I get it. Like my husband and I, we didn't have support in terms of like babysitters or, mm -hmm. um, and honestly, like I just don't generally trust like adults around my children. Mm -hmm. um, unsupervised so we don't do babysitters um a ton mm -hmm. and so i think we've had like three date nights since my mm -hmm. daughter has been born um mm -hmm. and it's it's not always easy um but there's always there's always a trade-off yeah i think it's interesting like the so you say like you're not anti-screen at all and i'm i'm in the same boat as you but there's such like a variation of how mm -hmm. different households treat screens and nothing like there's no like wrong right or wrong answer here but i think everyone can make adjustments to expose their children to a bit more independent play and non-screen activities and i think that's only going to benefit them mm -hmm. so like an adjustment we made recently is my husband and i decided we're gonna leave our phones in our bedroom when the kids are home so we don't ever have our phones on us when the kids are around. And, you know, I want to say we're amazing at it. It's hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think we need a landline downstairs because I'm like, oh, no one can get a hold of me. Um, that was an adjustment that I realized recently that I was like, this is so beneficial. Like they are getting my full attention. And yes, it's hard sometimes when I'm cooking and I'm like, oh gosh, how do I, what, I have to look up like this measurement. So when we have Alexa down, like, again, I'm not like no tech. We have Alexa. We have, yeah. we watch TV at night together, but I'm very sensitive, especially to like short form content. So my kids have never watched YouTube. Um, I don't even let them watch TV shows that much. Like we watch movies mostly that are like, have a story and a lesson. Like and I like feel like, arc. yeah. And like not an endless series of a show that just like, hooks you at the end and gets them watching the next one, the next one, the next one. Yeah. And they're so quick and like the cuts are so fast. So I want to like give them the gift of an attention span. <laughs> and so I think I'm always learning too and making like small adjustments in our house that I hope they will benefit from. And, and one thing I want to touch on is um, screens at school. So 
two of my kids are in public elementary school and they are given individual devices in class. And now that I'm realizing how much they use those devices, I feel like I have to be even more conservative at Monitored home. Monitored at home. Yeah, to mm-hmm. balance out the screen time they're getting at school. So what does your 11-year-old son's screen time look like at school? Is he getting a lot, do you think? Yeah, so we actually, um, I observed his class a couple of times. Uh-huh. Um, and they do. They definitely get more screen time than what I would personally prefer. Right. Uh, and I feel like prior to COVID, I'm sure that there were personal devices in classrooms more than what I realized. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I rem- I distinctly remember him going to kindergarten and he didn't have a device. Okay. Um, and then first grade COVID happened and he didn't have a device before then. And then he came home with a device mm-hmm. and now it's like the devices have just never left. And so there are a couple of things that I have asked his teachers the last couple of years in terms mm-hmm. of like, if you're not doing actual instruction time, like if it's just like tech time, can he please just like read a book and like I know that that kind of mm-hmm. singles him out yeah. um but he also he's a boy and so like if yeah. he's overstimulated or if he's like hyper it's even more of a challenge mm-hmm. um and I've we've been really fortunate that like his um his teachers in elementary school have been very supportive of it mm-hmm. um but honestly like there have been times where we have we've considered like is do we want to continue with public school Um, Yeah, specifically because it felt like he was getting a lot more screen time than what we were comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've tested the devices and we've, we've definitely seen that like they can access things that are um, not age appropriate for a 10 year old boy. Um, Yep. And so I think we're all just kind of doing the best that we can with what what's available to us. He's a very social kid. He really loves going to school. And so I don't want to take it away from him. Mm-hmm. Um, so at this point, the plan is for him to continue public school, but yeah. I don't, like, I feel like that's always subject to change, but I'm he, in the so, same boat. <laughs> as you. It's so hard. And I yeah. get that. Like, I, I do believe homeschool kids can have a very active social life, Yeah, uh, but he just, he's made friends. He loves his school. He loves his friends. Yeah. And he 10 enjoys. or 11 is a tough age to switch out. That's it is. Um, but, and something that my husband and I talk about a lot is like part of the reason that we have enjoyed this transition from like, I, I feel like being the typical like American family that had like the TV on in the background most of the time. And like, mm-hmm. um, things are very different now. And I feel like my kids both have just like an honest childhood more, mm-hmm. um, like they play. Whereas yeah. like, Three years ago, I didn't see my son play. And I thought at that point, like he was seven. So like, maybe he's just beyond play. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in the last like two years, like Mm -hmm. he plays and he, he builds things with magnetiles and he's almost 11. Yeah. Um, And so it's just been really incredible to like, see like, no, like they still like their, their little brains and like their emotions and like all of it, like they really do thrive with like an Mm -hmm. actual long childhood like childhood shouldn't end Mm -hmm. at age six seven years old yeah like a play-based childhood and if if your seven eight-year-old nine-year-old ten-year-old is spending a lot of time on devices and you want to take a step back like I think it's important to realize like they can get that play-based mindset back like they can can. transition back it may take a little bit because their brains have been wired one way to the electronic and the fast moving and all of that but it's not too late, I don't think, to no. pull back a little bit. I I mean, yeah, my eight, almost nine-year-old daughter like plays with dolls still. Like she and they, she wakes up in the morning and plays for an hour or reads, like without waking us up. And it's like so wonderful. Like she, she doesn't even have an option. And I want to touch on like every child is so different too. So my son, we did, we got the um, what were they called? Like fire, Amazon fire um mm-hmm. tablets, the tablets at some point. Yeah, for a for a an airplane, like a, tr- a trip. And then we had him at home and the kids liked him. So we're like, okay, we'll do 20 minutes a day of time they can spend on their tablets. And literally my six-year-old, it's like all he talked about, all he thought about, like was so obsessed with it that I was like, this isn't good. He's not putting yeah. any energy or thought into anything else, not being creative. He just wants to 
with the addictiveness of these games, like he would like have an egg that was going to hatch the next day. So it's like, you have to go back to like hatch your egg. Otherwise it like mm -hmm. dies or something. See what's like in that's there. stressful, you know, to like get back yeah. and, and the points for coming back every day. And, and I just didn't, I didn't feel good about that at all. And so we um, tried to cut back for a while and then he would sneak it. And so I was like, listen, this kid is especially sensitive to this and we're just going to pull it all together. And he has not brought it up like for a year. Like he doesn't care. He's completely now invested in his Bakugan and his you know, Pokemon cards. Like he doesn't <laughs> need the electronics. So like we, again, we'd be surprised at how quick our kids will um, transition off of the electronics and actually just like be more creative as children. Okay. So what are your thoughts around devices? So a lot of parents are starting with watches these days, so the smart watches um, at a certain age, uh, and also giving smartphones to their children, you know, pretty early, some as early as like eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. What are your thoughts around that? Like, what is your plan for giving your kids um, access to their own devices? Yeah, so that's changed over the years. Um, I would say, so he's about to turn 11, and so we homeschooled him for first grade during COVID. He went back in second grade. And mm -hmm. when he went back, I would say about half of his classmates had a cell phone. And I was really wow. surprised um, because I was like, well, he's not like, is he taking, like, he doesn't need to take a business call. Yeah. <laughs> he's not calling his friend. He's not asking to like call his friends on my phone. Like, what does yeah. he need? What do they need a cell phone for? And then like some of the kids like had parents that were divorced. So I can understand that. I feel like in those yeah. situations, there might be room for exploring what are the options um i would mm -hmm. never recommend a cell phone for a kid that's not in at least middle high school mm -hmm. um just there's mm -hmm. just too much opportunity too much freedom and it kind of goes back to like what what we had talked about previously where like you as a parent have to spend so much energy policing it and setting mm -hmm. these boundaries and making sure that the boundaries are followed and then like if they're not like is there a consequence and like Mm -hmm. It's just so much stress um, yep. that it's just, to me, I don't think it's worth it. Mm -hmm. um, so our plan for him two years ago, we initially thought like, well, maybe he's ready for a phone. I would say like 75% of his friends had phones and he was just getting to the age where he was starting to like have times where he was like going to someone's house without us. Mm -hmm. And so right. that kind of felt like, well, maybe like, I think as parents, we come up with the words of like case scenario, mm -hmm. like what if he's uncomfortable and yeah. like he wants yeah. to call us to come home Yeah, and that's yet to happen. Um, but <laughs> we thought about it and there was just something in me that was like, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel great about it. I want to test the waters. Mm -hmm. And so we got him literally like the day before they went off the market, we got him an iPod touch. Mm -hmm. And my thought process behind that was like, okay, you can only use it when it's like at home because we're not it's not connected to like a cell service and he has to use his dad's Apple ID to like okay. do anything. So he can't download apps without my husband, like typing in mm -hmm. a password. Right. Um, and I feel like those parameters made it so that like, he has this thing where he can like FaceTime his friends over the summer when they like want to talk or like make plans or sometimes like they'll play Minecraft together and they like mm -hmm. FaceTime each other. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But because he can't download apps consistently and because like there's no YouTube on it because there's, because it's literally just a communication device, mm -hmm. it's not as appealing for him. And yeah. like, he'll go days where it's just dead and he doesn't mm -hmm. notice. Yeah. Um, and so it's a tool I think that, for him. Like it's a tool, yeah. not a toy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that a lot of parents struggle with like, how do I introduce this in a slow way? Because you mm -hmm. don't want, you don't want your kid to like have no understanding or no access or be able to relate with their peers because that's mm -hmm. important. Um, but I do think that we also have to protect them. Um, so we're not planning on getting him a phone until he is probably in middle school. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be a smartphone. And those are conversations that we're having with him now because I don't want for him to get to like sixth grade and have this like expectation that he's going to get an iPhone and yeah. then he gets like a flip phone. Right, um, right. <clears throat> I want for him to have that understanding. So he, it, so yeah. we have a lot of very transparent conversations and I do have a large social media platform. So um, that I feel like that's given us some opportunities to have conversations around like, look, like 
I'm posting stuff that's just like about like parenthood and like people still make horrible comments on my stuff and I'm an adult. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like these are other adults. Like imagine my kids are saying to each other, like it's horrible. That's a great and, lesson. <laughs> I yeah, should start so doing he, that. <laughs> yeah. So I think he it's taken, you know, he started asking for a phone when he was about seven when he saw his friends. Mm. Um and it's it took probably a good like year and a half for him to like accept the fact that like mm-hmm. he's just not gonna get a phone for right now yeah um and there have definitely been like harder moments with that but I think that because we have taken the time to really explain the mm-hmm. rationale behind it um mm-hmm. and we also are really mindful about like because I think at his age peer experiences are really important so like we have his friends over and like we have a small group of friends wh- whose parents like I really like and like we mm-hmm. spend a lot of time together and they hang out they play mm-hmm. um they do things together. And so I feel like that alleviates some of that like pressure on him. Um, Mm -hmm. And we do not plan on introducing social media until he's like well into high school. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm a never unless some of these federal bills pass to make social media be safer. Um, But Like, but I get having to, having to teach them how to use something safely while they're in your home before you just like let them loose as an adult. So I don't know, luckily I have many years before that happens, but, um, how do you deal with when he goes to a friend's house that, and you know, that friend may have like a smartphone with, um, unrestricted access. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So, um, honestly, that isn't something that we have navigated at this point. Um, he really only has... He has, he has a lot of friends, um, but he really, Mm -hmm. he only has two or three friends that like, I have a rule where like, I'm protective of my time too, as like, Mm -hmm. I'm a whole person. And so like Mm -hmm. my weekends, I also want to do things that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so his friends, in order for us to like spend a fair amount of time with them, like I have to also like their parents and that sounds bratty sometimes. No, I think it's just honest. feel like. Yeah, um, I'm just not going to spend three hours with someone that I don't enjoy being around. Yeah, totally. And I, my son's also not old enough for me to feel comfortable being at, in someone else's home unless I really know their parents. And I'm not going to really know their parents <laughs> unless yeah. I happen to like them. Right, um, right. And so fortunately, he hasn't had, he ha- like I said, there's only two or three people that we really like. And I feel mm-hmm. like they're very similar-minded. Good. Um and so that hasn't been a thing. I do think that, okay. I think that there's a lot of room for transparency though. I think yeah. for some reason people get really uncomfortable telling other parents, like I'm not, for example, like one of his friends is allowed to watch YouTube, um, mm-hmm. but I've had a lot of conversations with his mom, like Enrique is not allowed to watch YouTube. That's just mm-hmm. not a thing. Um, yeah. And she is really respectful of that. And mm-hmm. when he's over there, like they don't watch YouTube right? Um, because it's just, an expectation. Yeah. It is uncomfortable. Those conversations. We had a play date with my eight year old, her friend at the park. And I chatted with the mom for like an hour and my daughter's friend asked for the mom's phone to look something up. And then the girls were then over on the grass, like just scrolling on the mom's phone. And I felt like, I don't want that to be happening, but I feel like I can't tell this mom like, Hey, don't give your daughter your phone, you know? So I just said, I got to go tell my daughter something. And so we walk over, I walked over there and was like, Hey, like, let's cut the phone and um, we're going to go in a few minutes. But I, it just felt very uncomfortable. And also like, I don't have that relationship with that mom yet where I felt like I could, and you have to, you start to feel like you're trying, like, I'm not better than anybody. I don't, I'm not trying to lecture anybody on their decisions. It's just what I've chosen for my child. So it is very tricky. (laughs) And I'm currently also assessing like our school community. And a lot of the parents are very heavy with the devices in our area. And so I'm second guessing to our school, like community. It's really hard. And I'm looking at we can't homeschool. I, I, I had to do recordings for at home for my work, yeah. but, um, looking at private schools, which are expensive. So there's no situation where you're going to have no exposure to other kids with devices, but 
um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to navigate for sure. Sorry, I cut you it off. It is, but and I well, I, so that leads to kind of the point where like we we don't want for our son to watch YouTube mm-hmm. because that's just something. But at the same time, like the older that they get, I feel like the more um, when there are one off situations, mm-hmm. it's not. It's easier to say like, okay, that's a one off situation. So like for yeah. example, like yeah. when my kids go to my dad's house, like mm-hmm. they're gonna watch more TV. Yeah, um, and me too. Yeah. So like, yeah, I think a lot of parents have, I've seen a lot of DMS where people are like, well, how do we deal with this? Like mm. when they go to grandpa's house, it's like, if it's not a problem, if it's mm-hmm. like you're going, if they're going over there once, um, you know, every couple of months, like don't sweat it. Like if your yeah. home yeah. culture is consistently like, these are mm-hmm. our values and our expectations when there are those one-off situations, like, yeah don't feel like you're like contaminating your kid from this yeah. like, one-off situation. I feel like we, it's like almost like that, like health food craze where yeah. it's like the one time I have 80, sugar, 20. like I'm going to yeah. break. Yeah. I, a mom just reached out to me the other day and was like, I am at a soccer team party and, or some sports team party and there's 20 kids and half of them have phones out. And what do I do? Because I can't, man, you know, I can't ask all these yeah, kids, no, parents. You just, and I was like, listen, don't stress about it's it. It's okay. Like you can always also communicate next time with your kid ahead of time and say, Hey, you know, that we don't do devices. So if, um, if you're seated next to a child with a device, and they're trying to show you things like you can remove yourself and do something else, or you can suggest to the kid, like, Hey, that's what I teach my daughter. Like say, Hey, to your friend, like, let's do this over here. Like, let mm-hmm. think of new ideas to do something different. That's not s- scrolling on YouTube. So yeah, that's totally relatable. And, and I totally agree that these one-off situations, like my kids just went to my parents' house where they do watch a lot more TV there. Um, and you know, it's just a balance. They also play hard there, but that's okay. Like they can have that balance. I think having that like home culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's, what's the most important. Yes. Agree. Okay. So we talked about social media briefly, but why do you feel like you're going to delay social media as long as you can? I mean, so many reasons. <laughs> I know. Um, I did a little bit of an experiment where I set up a second account, an Instagram account mm-hmm. um, in my husband's name. Mm-hmm. And I think I added like myself as a friend and like a mm-hmm. couple of like our mutual friends. Um, and I was amazed because to me, Instagram is generally like one of the more, it, it's not Clean-ish. Snapchat-ish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But like, even like on his explore page, it was like, like active, like women influencers that are like in very little clothing, which like, I don't have anything against, but like, it's just Mm -hmm. very interesting because that's not what's showing up on my Mm -hmm. explore page, but because he's, you know, a man in his forties, like that's what's showing up on his explore page, even though he hasn't interact, that account has not interacted with anything that would lead the algorithm to say like, this is what he wants to see. Yeah. So that is concerning. Um, and I feel like when you look at like the data and the research around like brain development, Mm -hmm. um, there's so much evidence that shows that like early exposure Mm -hmm. and repeat repeated exposure has the strong, has such a strong impact on like how they view things down the road. So like things Mm -hmm. like pornography, like Mm-hmm. And I, would I be upset with my like 17 year old son having like a playboy? Like, no, it's not what I want. Like, yeah. it's not what I want to come across as a parent. Um, right. But I think that's very different than like a 17 year old boy constantly being able to access hardcore porn. And I think that yeah. that changes how they view something yeah. that is very important because I feel like their adult sex life is something that is very important. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing like what the algorithms are pushing out to young boys is very mm-hmm. concerning for me. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. bullying aspect is very concerning for me, especially with, I know the personality of my son. He is very much like a people pleaser. Mm-hmm. He wants to like be liked. Yeah. Um, and having worked with, with teenagers mm-hmm. in my private practice, you know, I saw like we say like sticks and stones don't break your bones. Um, mm-hmm. But like when you're repeatedly being told that you're ugly or you're mm-hmm. unlikable over and over and over, and it's on a public platform, like yeah. the damage that it does 
And even if you, your kid makes it out through that and they're later on like a functioning adult, like that's just, I don't want for that to be the overarching like experience of their formative years. I want for yeah. them to have good friends and yeah. I want for them to have normal like experiences in person, face to face. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just so much room for like exploitation and yeah, the, I just, I can't wrap my brain around a way to make it a palatable, safe experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, it's not, unfortunately. Yeah. And if it were, like if it were just chatting with your friends, sending silly photos, uh, you know, maybe exploring an interest of yours, like a healthy interest, that would be fine. But unfortunately mm -hmm. the algorithms are serving harmful content. So if you would have set up that test account, even as a 13 year old who can sign up without parental permission, a male that same algorithm would have showed women in little clothing. It would have been very similar to what you saw on the adult man's algorithm feed, which is so concerning. I mean, the sexualized material on these children's yeah. feeds, let alone the predators and the bullying and the drug content and all this stuff. I mean, the social media companies are serving it to them because it's getting a reaction from them and it keeps them on the platform longer. Even yeah. if it's like a negative reaction, that actually has been proven to keep kids on there longer than even just like a happy reaction, which is really sick. So yeah, I'm with you. I think you're making the right decision there. And mm -hmm. you mentioned you mentioned pornography. I have a really good episode called, it's just called Kids in Porn. I listened to that. Good. Okay, yeah. Um, that was with Kristen Jensen at Defend Young Minds. And that was fascinating. I mean, the studies around how early access to pornography is affecting boys and teens and into adulthood. Yeah. Just the extent at which what they're being shown compared to what, you know, we may have seen when we were young is just pretty um, concerning. So recommend that um, social media can just be a gateway into all that type of content because social media houses a lot of that content as well. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's really important for parents to realize that just because social media platforms say they're for 13 year olds or targeted to kids as just a fun app, uh, doesn't mean that they're telling the truth. <laughs> um, yeah. and what they're being shown is highly inappropriate. Um, quite yeah. Often. And I'm sure they, I'm sure you've, you've read or come across the book, um, the anxious generation. Like I feel yeah. like it's very much like yeah. a hot topic right now, but yeah. I think that one of the things that, um, really stuck out for me is that like the actual data around it, the stark increase in mental health issues for young people yeah. as like iPhones became more and more available to mm -hmm. young people. I mean, I feel like adolescence is such a challenging time mm -hmm. across history. And then when yeah. you see like the, the rates at which kids are deteriorating and, and I think there's a lot of pushback to say like, well, maybe it's this other thing. Maybe it's the economy. Like our 16 year olds are worried about the economy suddenly. Um, you know, maybe it's the, like all of these wars being broadcast, but like mm -hmm. they, they've been able to really show, like there's a very clear correlation between like when iPhones were introduced and this huge dramatic increase in not just reported mental health issues because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people think like oh well the more that you know that something exists the more you're going to see it like but there's an increase in hospitalizations there's been an yeah. increase in like self-harm yeah. um, it's not just kids saying like I feel depressed like there's all of these different lenses and mm -hmm. measurements and metrics that have just jumped mm -hmm. so much since then that like we're not we're doing our kids a disservice if we're not paying attention yeah. I mean, this is, and this is why I started this podcast. Like last year I saw those rates in suicide specifically in suicide attempts. And I mean, scrolling to death, like I literally saw the connection between the amount mm -hmm. of scrolling being done by kids and they're um, not wanting to be here anymore. And that yeah. is not okay. Heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And if every parent knew that connection, I felt like there's no way we're going to be allowing our kids to access social media uh, and I think a lot of parents are setting those rules more strictly now, but the problem is that they can get access to it on their friend's devices, on another device that they on get the access device. to with, uh, yeah, on the school device, so many places that we don't have control over. So that's why I'm putting a lot of effort into legislation and trying to get like COSA passed and Sammy's law and these other bills that will 
force the companies to keep them safe or not show them this harmful, addictive, um, deadly content in some cases. Uh, so I think the, it's definitely good. Parent awareness is good, but also the, the tech companies have to do better. So, um, anything else that you want to share with parents today that we didn't cover related to screens or independent play, um, anything that we didn't touch on? Yeah. So I think that the main thing that parents come to me with, um, in Mm -hmm. terms of like, you know, how do we actually do like a low screen childhood, Mm -hmm. um, without making it like a ton of work is truly like through support, learning how to support independent play. And I think a lot of parents feel like there are only certain types of kids that can play independently. Mm -hmm. Um, Independent play looks a certain way, like it's very quiet with toys. Like I think a lot of people have this like Montessori view of like what Mm -hmm. independent play looks like. Um, And I just want for parents to know that like your, your only child can play independently. Your child that has like five siblings that are always up in their business can play independently. Mm -hmm. Um, your high energy child can play independently, your brand new infant can play independently. And you just have to really understand what independent, independent play means and Mm -hmm. what it looks like and how to support it. And it takes so much off of the parent because Mm -hmm. we, I think the other, the challenge with screens is that we have become like this driver of constant entertainment for kids and that's also not good for their development so even Mm -hmm. if they're not watching tv if you are constantly like directing and guiding their play you Mm -hmm. they're not getting the same benefits to play and they're not getting the same developmental um results from play that some that a child who has um an opportunity to be bored and to figure things out Mm -hmm. Um, And there's so much data that shows like emotional regulation is learned through independent play. Mm. Um, And so I think we are seeing a rise in a lot of kids that have a lot of behavioral challenges. And I think that there is a very strong tie to the decrease in autonomous independent play for kids and those challenging behaviors. Yeah. And knowing that you don't have to schedule your kid out the whole day, right? And giving them time. Yeah. Like yeah. you, people ask me all the time, like, what is y'all schedule? Like, well, she wakes up and she mm-hmm. had like, we make breakfast together yeah, uh, and she eats and then like she plays and then she eats lunch and then yeah. she plays and then she takes a nap and then she yeah. plays. Yeah. And if I'm bored, maybe we'll go to Target, you know, like, yeah. it, like, like, it's not like, okay, from two to four is our active playtime or like yeah. from 10 to 11 is sensory play. Um, yeah. Like, no, like she, she just kind of bops around. Um, yeah. And she hangs out near me, um, but she figures out how to entertain herself. And yeah, it's really amazing to see a, a kid who has done that since birth. And she has very high energy. Mm-hmm. She is very, um, she's very spicy. She's like the opposite type of child that people think when they think like independent play, like she's not like the calm, yeah. like playing nice, like, yeah, with little figurines like she's like she's wild she's feral she's all over the place she <laughs> climbs things like mm-hmm. she's it's it's so much fun and it's so nice to like see her get to have this like experience of early childhood yeah it's incredible that you saw that connection between the screen use and not being able to play independently um, in your son and that you did have a nice little break there (laughs) to be able to learn those lessons, right? And apply them from birth. That's so wonderful. Um, So I hope that parents will like take something from this and apply it to their own families, whether your kids are little toddlers, babies, or even older. Like I said, we can take a step back, pull it back a little bit, give it a couple of weeks to adjust and then like see how everyone's feeling. And I bet that you'll see some improvements in the household, um, mood and all of that. Andrea, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm a big fan of your work um, and the message you're pushing out to parents that like this independent play thing with Jonathan Haidt's book, Anxious Generation, which I highly recommend. But one of his four new norms is like getting back to the play-based childhood with independent Mm -hmm. play. And so Um, I thank you for supporting that message. I think it's so important. Uh, And again, just thank you for having this conversation with me. Yeah, absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome.